Today I'm going to talk about the importance of the environment in genetically informed research on addictions. And I kind of feel like Dr. Messing really kind of set the stage really nicely for this talk. And Ian as well. So I teach a class in behavioral genetics. And usually when I introduce a new disorder like schizophrenia or depression or alcohol use disorder, I like to talk about the epidemiology or the geographic distribution of the prevalence of the disorder around the world. And it turns out that for addictive disorders, for all addictions actually, you see much more geographic variation than pretty much any other kind of disorder like schizophrenia or depression. And that's a major clue that genes can't tell the whole story and that the environment is very important. So this is a map of uh, alcohol consumption around the world. Uh, darker countries are countries where more, more people, a greater proportion of people in that country consume alcohol. Lighter countries, fewer people consume alcohol. And so if you look at Australia, it's funny you mentioned Australia. <laughs> if you look at Australia, it, this is a country where most people, maybe 90% of people consume alcohol. But nearby, a short flight away, is Indonesia, where, where most people do not consume alcohol. So there's huge differences around the world in terms of who consumes alcohol, who consumes alcohol to excess, and who is at risk for developing alcohol-related problems. And um, you can also see those differences even within the United States. So uh, Dr. Shukla showed, showed a picture of binge drinking in different states and showed that, that there's variability even across the United States in the prevalence of binge drinking in the different, in the different states. And so what I wanted to look at was if um, one could try to see whether maybe genetic risk for alcohol use disorder may be differentially expressed depending on what kind of environmental context you're living in. Like maybe what country, what state, what neighborhood. So thinking about environmental moderation of and genetic influences on alcohol problems, you could think about drinking prohibitive environments where maybe the genes for alcohol problems may be relatively muted. So think maybe Indonesia. Or you could think of a, uh, maybe a drinking facilitated environment, let's say Australia, where the genetic risk factors for alcohol problems might be more amplified. So that's the idea, maybe, that things might differ depending on where you happen to live. So I looked at this within a twin study, where you compare the similarity of monozygotic twins who share 100% of their genes to dizygotic twins who share, on average, 50% of their genes. And if the monozygotic twins are more similar than the dizygotic twins, you can infer that there are some genetic influences at play. And the twin study is a nice complement to a molecular genetic study that Dr. Geiser talked about. In a molecular genetic study, you're directly measuring genes, individual genes. In a twin study, you're indirectly estimating the aggregate influence of genes. So in the study I did, I estimated the contribution of, or the proportion of variation in alcohol problems that was uh, attributed to genetic factors, shared environmental factors, things like social class, race, neighborhoods, and unique environmental factors, things that are specific to the individual. So I looked at the proportion of variation in alcohol problems attributed to those three things. The heritability is the proportion of variation in alcohol problems that can be explained by genetic factors. So that's mostly what I'm going to be focusing on here today, not the environmental factors. This is a map of the United States showing the density of alcohol outlets in each county in the United States. And so this is the environmental context I'm focusing on, is the density of alcohol outlets, not actually in the county, um, looking at a more fine-grained level. The, at the neighborhood level, the picture wasn't as pretty, but this kind of gives you an idea of, of the variation in the United States of the density of alcohol outlets in different counties. And I should say the darker counties are the ones that have a denser, a greater density of outlets, and the lighter ones are the, would have lower density of al alcohol outlets. And I want to show you a zoom in on uh, Missouri. Um, and so um, there's a county in the middle of Missouri that has a high density of outlets right here. <laughs> that happens to be Boone County, where we're, our university is. And so this is pretty typical of a college town that you have a greater density of alcohol outlets. And this is the density of alcohol outlets in a US, a US national sample of twins and siblings that I looked at. So this is just to give you an idea of how, what kind of neighborhoods these twins and siblings were living in. So, Along the x-axis here is the number of outlets per square kilometer in the census tract that they were living. So again, the census tract is a smaller geographic unit, uh, smaller than a county, more like what you might think of as a neighborhood. Um, so ranging from zero outlets all the way up to uh, more than 10 outlets. And so I'm focusing mostly on uh, the on-premises outlets in blue here. 
So an on-premises alcohol outlet is one where you purchase alcohol to be consumed on, on the premises, like in a restaurant or in a bar. Off-premises outlets are where you purchase alcohol to be consumed elsewhere. So that would be a liquor store, a convenience store, a grocery store. And all outlets are just the two combined. So I'm mostly focusing on me here now on the um, on-premises outlets in blue. Um, so most people live in, a, in places, neighborhoods with, with a few outlets, but some live in pretty outlet-dense neighborhoods. So you could think of these types of neighborhoods where there's maybe just where there are no outlets as maybe more prohibitive for the genetic influences on alcohol problems to be expressed, maybe muted gen, gen, muting genetic influences. And over here, this might be a more facilitated environment where, where the genetic influence on alcohol problems may be more amplified, more likely to be expressed. So here are the results. The layout is kind of similar to the previous slide. It, oh, down on the x-axis, we all still have the number of outlets per square kilometer in the census tract. But over here is the proportion of variance. And this is the proportion of variance in alcohol problems that's explained by genetic factors or the heritability. And that can range from 0 to 1. So the kind of neighborhood that you live in influences the heritability of alcohol problems, ranging from oh, down here, where in neighborhoods with zero outlets, the heritability is 11%. It's not even significant. Um, to here, if you live in a neighborhood with more than 10 outlets, the heritability is 78%. So the heritability is increasing from 11% up to 78%, depending on what environment you're living in. So that's a seven-fold increase in heritability, just based on the environmental context. So this is an example of gene-environment interaction. Uh, so you could think of this as genetic control of sensitivity to the environment. You could also flip it around and say this could be environmental control of the expression of genes. I'm going to kind of skip past a lot of this, but just for time's sake, but um, I wanted to talk about this last point, which is that uh, most of you are probably thinking that alcohol outlets are preferentially located in worse, poorer neighborhoods. So I took that into account in all these models, and the neighborhood, the alcohol outlet density effects remained, um, even when you took into account actually taking into account state effects, neighborhood effects, it still remained. So these results suggest that individuals who are genetically predisposed to develop alcohol problems may be especially sensitive to the influence of many alcohol outlets in their community. And this has clear implications for prevention, intervention. That is, restricting the density of alcohol outlets may reduce alcohol-related harms by placing limits on the extent to which an individual an individual's genetic liability to develop alcohol problems can be actualized. That's really a mouthful, but what I'm trying to say here is that you can change the environment. The government can restrict how many outlets are in, an, in a state or in a neighborhood, and um, that kind of change will be most beneficial to those people who are genetically at risk to develop alcohol, alcohol problems. Um, I want to acknowledge the source of the data that I use, which, which comes from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. Also, my collaborator is Tom Piasecki here at University of Missouri, former postdoc, um, Ariel Deutsch. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>